that the incidence of traumatic brain injury is four times population growth because of industrialization and because of uh, road traffic uh, use increasing. This has a global uh, and enduring impact. There's enormous burden of late morbidity in survivors, and even mild TBI can have prolonged symptoms. There's concerns that disability may be progressive in a proportion of patients. About 20% of patients don't get better. They don't just not get better. They actually get worse. So it may be triggering some kind of a chronic process. And it's an important epigenetic risk factor for late dementia. And that increased risk is somewhere between 1.5 and 10 times the baseline risk, depending on the severity of injury and also on uh, your, your underlying genotype. So uh, we currently classify traumatic brain injury very crudely. We use the Glasgow Coma Scale, and it's the 40th anniversary a couple of years ago. And basically, it looks at whether you open your eyes spontaneously to speech, to pain or not, verbal response, where you're oriented in time, place, and person, confused, inappropriate, incomprehensible sounds or none, motor response, you obey commands, localized pain. If you get poked somewhere, you go to that point, you withdraw from pain you have abnormal posturing, or you don't. So the point about this is, uh, there are two points to make. One is that even a chair has a Glasgow Coma scale of three. So you can't get down to zero. And the second thing is that this is for an adult. Obviously, if you're a teenager, the highest you get to is you don't open your eyes to anything before 12 o'clock in the morning. You, you never obey commands. And the best responses you can get are incomprehensible grunts until uh, sort of uh, late evening. So it's age specific, so that's important. But then we classify traumatic brain injury based on this as mild TBI, where the Glasgow Coma Score is 13 to 15. And typically, these people are conscious, but may be confused. But even with this, somewhere between 10 and 30% of patients are disabled, cognitively disabled at three to six months. Moderate TBI with the Glasgow Coma Score of nine to 12, and 50% of these people are disabled at six months. And severe TBI, where people don't respond to commands and are essentially in coma after the traumatic brain injury, there's 75% death or disability at, uh, at, at uh, six months. So it's a bad disease. But you can make it better. We know that simple intensive care can improve these outcomes substantially. The point is we want to find out what the processes are and be able to match treatments to uh, patients so that, uh, as I'll show you later, we're using more precision medicine. And this is the problem. So these are patients with CAT scans of the brain, all of whom have been diagnosed as having severe TBI. And that's based on the fact that you say, lift up your arm, and they don't lift up their arm, OK? And they're not opening their eyes spontaneously, and they're perhaps just grunting. Uh, so they have the same behavioral response, but they have very different underlying pathologies. This is what's called an extradural hematoma. It typically is associated with a fracture of the skull and a tear of an artery. Very little underlying brain injury. So if you take out the blood clot, the person will do dramatically well because they don't have underlying brain injury. These are contusions uh, with an extradural on the other side. This is diffuse brain swelling on this side. This is diffuse brain swelling with a subdural hematoma on the surface of the brain that's usually associated with brain injury. This swelling here is not something that we have a, a good treatment for. I mean, we've got a whole load of medical treatments which are um, in, in our algorithm here. But we don't understand the pathophysiology well. I mean, when we hear about cancer, doctors going and saying, we're going to look at the uh, genomics of the tumor and treat patients appropriately, we are hugely envious. Because for us, the genome is the host genome. It's the response to injury that's different. And this classification takes no account of those variations in either the, the disease or the host, both of which are very important. And it com combines variable prognosis, very different pathophysiology, and different treatment needs. And as a result, though we have multiple therapies in use, we don't have really high quality evidence for any of those. And what we would like to do is to do this, to practice precision medicine, where we match patients to the most appropriate therapy. But what we're currently doing is a bit more like this. It's from our one size fits none line. So we use all of the treatments and all of the people, not based on whether they're most precise for that patient, but because we know that they're the least toxic or the least side effects. But that may be the wrong thing, because if the disease is really severe, then maybe we should be using some of those more powerful and potentially um, toxic or treatments with more side effects earlier so that you limit the progress of pathophysiology.
So, uh, for this reason, we uh, asked for funding for Centre TBI, and uh, my partner in crime for this is uh, Andrew Maas, who's actually the, the senior coordinator. I'm, I'm the co coordinator, so if anything goes wrong, his neck's on the block. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, we got this, and, and essentially, it's a precision medicine and comparative effectiveness research um, program which involves over 80 scientists from uh, 43 institutions. And INCF is up at that corner for a reason you'll see in a second, because we also have over 70 investigating centers which are recruiting patients to these studies. And one of the things we need to do is to find all the data, bring it to one place and analyze it and see the patterns that would allow us to differentiate uh, patient subgroups in order to be able to, to exercise precision medicine. And INCF, have been the key uh, people in that context with uh, generous funding from One Mind, and we've been trying to make this uh, happen. We're in the process where we're two thirds uh, uh, towards recruiting all of our patients, and then we have to follow up and curate the data, but we're making substantial and, and rapid progress. So, this is the study uh, it collects data from 5,400 patients, 1,800 need stratum. So not by mild, moderate, or severe, we're also convinced that it's not just specific therapies, but systems of care that make a difference. So if you have uh, patients who are rapidly picked up from the roadside, come to the emergency department quickly, are triaged rapidly and appropriately, have surgery or go to intensive care as they need very quickly, even if you're not doing anything different, the fact that patients move slickly through that pipeline of care means that the outcomes are much better. So we want to see how patients are treated in different areas and find out whether, for example, having a trauma team arrive at the emergency department makes a difference. And that may be much more important than having some specific treatment or not. So we've got these strata from the ER, the admission and the ICU stratum. But we're also collecting data on the centers. So we have center profiling, which provides the context of care, the healthcare systems, the institution and unit characteristics the population served, the protocols and practice. So those broad brush questions. And it's really uh, important because, for example, there's a suggestion that if you have really good general intensive care for the severely injured patient who turns up, then your traumatic brain injury outcomes are likely to be better. But also, if you have specialist neurointensive care experience, that may improve outcomes. And we need to understand how those two balance out. In the background, we are also collecting uh, data from uh, patients uh, who are not consented, but only administrative data that's providing registry-based data, which doesn't need regulatory approval, which, no, sorry, which ha needs regulatory approval, but we have approval not to get consent. And then we have sub-studies. So this is very broad brush data, no uh, great detail. And sub-studies where we're collecting really highly dense data, very granular data. So there's an MR sub-study, which is acquiring data from about one third of the patients at three time points. High resolution ICU data, really only in about 10% of the overall population, but probably closer to 20% of the uh, ICU patient, where we're collecting high resolution, up to 50 hertz data, advanced hemostasis in 20 centers, electrocorticography in five centers, which are putting uh, indwelling electrodes, and EEG uh, in unspecified number, there's funding that's going forward to try and get that. And then we have a whole load of embedded and associated studies. So these are our research targets, better characterization of disease severity, disease process and outcome, looking at the effectiveness of care and treatment, evidence to underpin clinical guidelines and knowledge transfer. And this is how we have it. This is the core data set of about 5,000 patients. The study registries outside that 20 to 30,000. And then we have collaborating national registries from the UK and Germany in particular, and then international comparisons, which I'll come to later. And then these enhanced data sets in about a, a third of the patients. So what we can do, because these are all, uh, if you like, like Russian dolls, one inside the other, is we can make sure that the really high dense density data we collect in the MR and ICU sub-studies are represented or representative of the broader populations <coughs> that our core data set is representative of the study registry, that the study registry in participating centers are representative of national or regional registries. And then we can compare, they don't have to be, but then we can compare different national registries and we can compare international comparisons as well. 
And this will lead us to undertaking a, a variety of research outputs. There's evidence synthesis, which uh, is a key part of what uh, INCF is contributing. And there's evidence communication and evidence translation. And very importantly, there's legacy because we have clinical data, the neuroimaging, genomics, biomarkers, the high resolution ICU data, clinical and patient assessed <laughs> outcomes. And this is the intellectual capital that will derive from the center TBI study and will provide dividends and the people who are banking that intellectual capital for us are INCF. So I told you that there are international studies and the, the center TBI study is one part of a whole load of international studies which form the INTBA collaborative which is the international uh, initiative for traumatic brain injury research with all of these um, uh, participants, the European Union, the National Institutes of Health, CIHR from Canada, One Mind. I understand now that the Ontario Brain Institute is also part of uh, this as a funding partner. And what this does is to fund data collection with similar, hopefully identical, but never going to be identical platforms, but very similar, which will allow uh, aggregation from studies in Europe, uh, USA, Canada, and what we hope is we'll be able to bring together all of these studies. The direct and leverage funding thus far is probably now touching about $100 million. We have data on over 2,500 patients, 10,000 of whom will be fully characterized with genomics, uh, biomarkers, and so on. The involvement of Chinese, Indian sites, and now South Africa is getting interested will provide a generational op opportunity for global TBI research. And our hope is that INTBA will come to be talked of rather like the Framingham study is talked of now for cardiovascular research. It will provide that kickstart in the repository for us to understand TBI as a disease, but using the, uh, the, the eyes of science. So these are the opportunities, fantastic opportunities, global collaboration, but the, the, the proof of the pudding is in the implementing. And the problem is that TBI research is not an average day at the office. If you're running uh, Alzheimer's disease, you say, I'm going to see a thousand patients with mild cognitive impairment. When am I next in clinic? I'll write down the diary. And they'll come, you send an appointment, they turn up, and the patient sits there quietly, gives you a history, you take a blood sample, and they go away. And that evening, you go out and have a glass of wine and dinner and say, I've reached my thousandth patient. Our data collection starts here. This is when the patient has multiple trauma. So this is one of my colleagues, Ari Erkol, who also works in pre-hospital medicine, took this uh, at somewhere he went to. To start off, the subject in this context was head down. The, the, the cab of this lorry had flipped over. And the first two hours of this whole uh, disease uh, activity was getting this patient out. Now, that may seem like a needless uh, detail. What has that got to do with the research? It's really important because when this guy is upside down, he's got really abnormal physiology and that impacts on outcome. And keeping this guy upside down with inappropriate blood pressures may completely negate anything that we do over the next, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 days acutely and in rehab. Now we can't do anything. This guy's going to turn up. He's an upside down patient. The only way we'd be able to get him straight if he was in Australia, I suppose. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, these are confounders that we do need to account for. The patient then pitches up in the emergency department, and this is, this is a real world, this is not set up, this is from Jeff Manley's uh, center at UC, UCSF. And you're trying to save lives at the same time as trying to do research. And it is, it is a, a, a tremendous uh, challenge, because many of the early pathophysiological indicators are the ones that are going to drive disease and provide the most useful biomarkers for understanding disease. And doing that at the same time as everything else is happening is a problem. And then they come to the ICU. This is our ICU. Uh, and it looks uh, fine. But the problem then is that the amount of data multiplies. This is the physiological um, data display system that we have. ICM Plus uh, derived, uh, devised by Peter Smileski and, and Marek Chosnika. And we get a huge amount of imaging data. Originally, the disadvantage was that it was only CT. The advantage was that it was only CT. We had only one modality. Now we've got MR. We undertake PET studies in these patients as well from the acute point onwards. And the difficulty is that these are over 1,000 data points per day. This is multi-episode, multi-modality, multi-sequence, and highly variable from one subject to the other. 
And then for the sorts of studies we're doing, when we get to the point where we're following these patients up, it's another challenge because in a European study as opposed to a, a, an American study, you have many more languages. So one of the first things we had to do in Center TBI was to translate all of the outcome instruments of these 22 languages. And the only reason there's no, there's a red cross across Russian there is because they're not recruiting pediatric patients. So they didn't have a pediatric uh, Glasgow outcome scale. So uh, uh, enormous number of challenges. We have a huge heterogeneity of data with fuzzy definitions, but broadly we've got cross-sectional data, demographics, mechanism, outcome, longitudinal data, small number over time, generally to do with trends. These are IID data. These are independent, identically distributed data, and traditional statistics will hold. And then we've got time series data, which is higher sampling, typically regular, but up to 50 hertz, temporal substructure with data within data, not IID because lots of autocorrelation. And these traditional statistical assumptions that we've had have been violated by those data sets. And imaging data provide a different kind of challenge. The large data sets with high spatial resolution but relatively low temporal resolution. Serial imaging with multiple modalities moving from CT to MR. Even in a research study, if someone's just had an MR, you wouldn't take them to a CT because these are sick patients. You don't want to transfer them unless it's absolutely essential. So you have to find some way to interleave modalities and transfer information from one modality to the other. And so we have low resolution and high spatial or temporal resolution as a spectrum. What about the data we're collecting at the bedside? So as an example, uh, starter, we collect data on blood pressure and we collect uh, data on intracranial pressure. You have a probe put into the head, which is measuring intracranial pressure in a severely injured patient. <laughs> Why is that important? It's important because the difference between these two drives blood flow to the brain, the cerebral perfusion pressure. So mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. And the reason you want that blood flow to the brain is to provide glucose and oxygen to provide energy. But in the patient who's had a traumatic brain injury, the intracranial pressure goes up. And when the intracranial pressure goes up, this difference comes down. And as a consequence of that, you don't have oxygen and the glucose gets converted to lactic acid. So this is fundamental biochemistry. But it's what's happening in the brain, but the great advantage is we can actually interrogate this. And we do, we use it as part of our clinical management in these patients. So patients have, uh, with severe TBI in Cambridge and many other places will have an intracranial pressure bolt placed. In Cambridge, we put in a triple lumen bolt, which also has a brain tissue PO2, which is telling us about oxygen levels in the brain, and a microdialysis catheter, which allows us to look at uh, various metabolites in the brain, and also mediators in research studies like cytokines. So we're looking at all of this physiology and we can set thresholds based on, um, uh, I'll have to laugh or spit as I say it, expert opinion, uh, but we have some ideas about what are likely to be effective, but we don't know what dose of abnormal physiology is responsible for outcome. Is it a peak? Is it the area under the curb? Is it some combination of those? And similarly, cerebral perfusion pressure, we have certain targets that we aim for but we need to be able to empirically define how much intracranial pressure elevation and what patterns is bad so that we don't use our treatments inappropriately. None of our treatments are risk-free. All of the treatments we use in, in intensive care, particularly in traumatic brain injury, have risks of their own. So there's a quote from Hamlet uh, from Shakespeare which says, diseases desperate grown by desperate measures are relieved or not at all. But if you're going to use a desperate measure, so one of, the, one of the interventions is to take the top of the skull off because the intracranial pressure is very high, a decompressive craniectomy. If you do that as a first go, every time the ICP goes up, we know that it's not just not good, we know it's bad. There's a trial run from Australia, the DECTRA study, which shows that it was bad. We've just got the results of the rescue ICP study coming out next week. I couldn't possibly tell you what the results are, <laughs> but it's coming out next week, um, uh, hopefully, and we will uh, be able to find out exactly where in that hierarchy we should be able to put decompressive craniectomy. But we need to be able to quantify the physiology. We need to be able to quantify that burden of abnormal physiology to do this in a rational way. So we have, as I said, these thresholds, and they're based on um, associations, but we need to be able to do this more sophisticated. And the important point is that uh, we can interrogate the biology more in more detail. But that's not all. We've got the intracranial pressure. We've got all the biochemistry. And 
really, um, we've got those three lumens and it depends on what sensors you put down. So we're in collaboration with IMEC, for example, to try and develop multi-parameter sensors directly. But we can also correlate the uh, different parameters. I talked to you about intracranial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure. But we know that the relation between those two tell, uh, tells us whether the brain is autoregulating or not. And if the brain is autoregulating, that it can cope with small reductions or increases in blood pressure without having the uh, cerebral blood flow suffer, that's a huge advantage. And we can find the range, the sweet spot where the brain, an individual brain and an individual patient is doing that, if we can analyze the data better. And what we also have to do uh, by looking at these relations here between mean arterial pressure and ICP is to find ways of displaying the data, which again is a really interesting uh, thought in the context of the previous session. So uh, uh, Marcel Aries and, and uh, Ari Ercole have been using this kind of display, which has still not been validated. What we want to do is to make it easy for clinicians to say, this is the target that we should be aiming for. How are we doing? What more do we need to do to get to that target? And then there's a huge amount of, um, detail that we can explore. So here we've got uh, 1,500 seconds. What's that? Um, 30 minutes-ish of, of, uh, of data. And what you have here is the mean arterial pressure, the blood pressure on top, and the intracranial pressure below. And you can see what's happened is that the intracranial pressure has uh, jumped up here, and you've got a change in blood pressure there as well. You don't know which one is primary and which one is secondary. But being able to look at the patterns at least asks you to ask the question. We can then go in and try and find out what's happening at a slightly greater detail. This is 300 seconds, five minutes worth of data. And now you're seeing that there are fluctuations in, in the intracranial pressure waveform, not just from beat to beat, but also over time, which may reflect respiratory or cardiovascular uh, systemic variation. Or you can go to five seconds. And now the waveform itself, the high resolution waveform at 50 hertz, which is being sampled, gives you additional information that can tell you about compliance in the intracranial cavity. Because when you think about it, every time the heart beats, it's chucking some proportion of blood. So the, the stroke volume from the heart is 50 mils. About 25% of that goes into the head. The head is a closed box. So if you chuck in 12 and a half mils of blood into the head, which is a closed box, if the intracranial cavity is compliant, the brain is lax, then you'll have very small rise in intracranial pressure. If it's a tight head with lots of swelling, you'll have a big rise in intracranial pressure. So those relations will allow us not just to tell, you, tell uh, clinicians about how bad the situation is, but how bad it might become in a little while. So this kind of predictive algorithm would be a really interesting thing to pursue. And then we can look at more details uh, with uh, looking at the frequency spectrum and other behaviors, both linear and nonlinear. And we take for this a lot of uh, stuff from looking at um, uh, time variant data in time series. So the quiz that uh, we often show is which of these is a healthy patient? And you guys are all informed. Which of these do you think is a, is a healthy patient? Sorry? The second one, yeah. So the, the point is this. So if you, if you look, that's sleep apnea. This is heart failure. This is preset and cardiac death. And the point is this. We keep talking about homeostasis as though healthy systems try and hold on to a golden mean. But that's not true. What you have is homeokinesis, that it allows the, the system to flex and extend as is needed to make uh, the system work. And disease generally results in decomplexification if you look at this. So one of the things we want to explore in this data is homeokinesis rather than homeostasis. And that noise, and someone said this earlier um, during the discussion, that noise is not really noise. There's a lot of detail that we might be able to get information for. So this is Ari Erkol, whom I've been talking about, who, who leads a lot of this. He cheated before he came to do medicine. He did a PhD in condensed matter physics in Cambridge. So I think that that's un unfair. But he, he's really interested, he's really interested in, in, in data and has been using nonlinear analysis, um, wavelet analysis, and looking at things like the Holder coefficient to understand the, complex, the complexity of data. And has been collaborating very closely with David Nelson in Stockholm through INCF. And, and, and one of the great advantages of Center TBI is that it's brought people uh, like Ari and the people in INCF and David Nelson together. The same thing applies to imaging as well. This is conventional CT imaging uh, with an extradural hematoma. CT is great because it tells you whether you want to do an operation or not now. 
okay, we wouldn't be able to decide that and what operation unless you had the CT scans. But the problem is it's not very sensitive to some kinds of pathology. These are near contemporaneous CT and MR in the same patient from our institution. You can see, first of all, that the brainstem lesion, even in retrospect, it's difficult to see, but there's a clear brainstem lesion in the dorsolateral quadrant of the midbrain, which is prognostically hugely important. And then this medial temporal contusion, which is sort of there, has a lot more detail to do with that. Why is that important? Because the brainstem keeps you alive. The hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe are going to hold your memories and cognitive capacities in, in a great deal uh, of detail. And understanding precisely what's happening would be really important. So uh, just to go back one, this lesion here is an example of what we call traumatic axonal injury. The, the lay person thinks that if you get bashed on the head, you'll get uh, an injury underneath. It does happen sometimes, but much more commonly what happens are indirect forces. So first of all, the brain moves inside the skull and both accelerates and decelerates more quickly. So the impact on the inside of the skull results in injury. Because we are a gyrencephalic species, you have lots of folds in the brain. And in order to hold them snugly in place, particularly in the anterior temporal and inferior frontal lobes, you have sharp ridges in the, in the skull. And if you're trying to slide the brain or bash into those, you tend to get a lot of bruising of the brain, you get contusions. The other thing that happens is that the brain, when it accelerates and decelerates very quickly, with rapid, um, say, with a motor vehicle accident, the brain flicks and all of the white matter fibers that are going up into the brain are fanning out. And when you flick it, or when there are rotational injuries, they tear. And that type of injury, traumatic axonal injury, is probably, in patients who survive, the biggest driver of the quality of functional outcome, and is almost not detected at all by CT scanning. What we do see sometimes is that the blood vessels that are going alongside those radiating nerve fibers are sometimes torn, and you see microhemorrhages, but that's quite crude and not very sensitive, and not very specific, because it may have different uh, important effects, and we need to try and understand all of that better. So as an example of that, what we have is here a, a, a specific sequence called the susceptibility weighted imaging. This is from Siemens, but other companies have their own versions. And you can see even on a conventional flare sequence, which is what most people would use to look for pathology, you've got a little bit of lesion here, but that's because of the ICP bolt having gone down, and it's caused a big hole there which is an artifact from the susceptibility. But you can see all the microhemorrhages much more clearly because the susceptibility weighted imaging is exquisitely sensitive to those microhemorrhages. So this is a more sensitive but indirect measure of traumatic axonal injury. But you can use uh, diffusion weighted imaging and diffusion tensor imaging to actually image that white matter uh, uh, abnormality with traumatic axonal injury and try and quantify it better to find out what the burden now of disconnection is that's leading to disability. And you can look also at, at the evolution of, of uh, pathology. So here, this is 14 hours after injury, a shearing contusion here because the different layers of the brain have moved at different rates. And essentially, there's been a tear in the fabric of the brain there. And you can see that it, it's, it's laid out in a way which suggests that there were rotational forces involved. So that's the anatomy. This is a PET cerebral blood flow scan, also performed uh, at between 12 and 16 hours after the injury. And you can see the abnormal pathophysiology goes far beyond the, the local anatomy. And this is a diffusion-weighted imaging map. So this is work from Virginia Newcomb, who is a postdoctoral clinical scientist in our group. But the point to make is this, that if you look at the 14-hour flare image here around this contusion in the front, you've got a core. And around that, you've got an area of pericontusional edema. But around that, tissue looks normal. But when you look at diffusion-weighted imaging and diffusion tensor imaging, the characteristics there are of, some, of, of tissue that has cytotoxic edema that's on the verge of dying. And you can see that that's likely to be because of abnormal physiology. And sure enough, we follow the patients up, the lesion expands. So this is what we would call the traumatic penumbra, an intervention that prevented this from going and developing into this would be really useful and we have here a biomarker that would allow us to interrogate it. But quantifying this, trying to find automated methods to actually look at this is not going to be easy. At a later time point, we might want to look at the disconnections I talked to you about. This is, again, work from uh, Virginia uh, as part of her PhD with me. What we have here is whole brain tractography. Um, uh, and you're looking at all of the white matter face on. 
the corpus callosum there, and then the radiating uh, fibers into the temporal and frontal lobes, and down here the brain stem. And this is a, a normal subject, it's one of our neurosurgeons, so about as normal as you get. Uh, <laughs> so then I, I, I'm going to show you one patient out of our, uh, our, our study at uh, two days, one week, six weeks, six months, and one year after the injury. And what you can see is that there's loss of white matter from two days up to one week and six weeks. Look at the corpus callosum, that's where it's most obvious. But what is really interesting is that there's continued white matter loss as you go on from six weeks to six months to one year, even between six months and a year. This doesn't happen in everyone. It happens in 10, 20% of patients. And there are pa pathological studies which suggest that this white matter loss is real. And very importantly, it correlates with the trajectory of recovery or with the trajectory of worsening that you see in these small numbers of patients, suggesting that it's, it's not just uh, an imaging artifact, but it's biologically and clinically important. And finally, we can try and find, uh, this is not part of Center TBI, but Center TBI will provide the platform for designing these studies. Ask what is the biological process that's driving that? This is group, uh, work from our group, which is imaging amyloid deposition in the brain after traumatic brain injury. Patients deposit amyloid in the brain, even young patients, teenagers, children, within hours of traumatic brain injury. Why does that happen? Well, you've got all this axonal tearing, amyloid precursor protein gets spilt out, <laughs> and it's chewed up by, by uh, processing enzymes, by secretases, and the clearance mechanisms are simply overwhelmed. And as a consequence of that, you get buildup of amyloid plaque. About a month or so after that, it goes away. And then by the time you look at about a year, it's all cleared up. But what Willie Stewart, whom we collaborated with here, has shown from his group in Glasgow, is that if patients die many years after TBI, 20, 30 years, they show age-related amyloid plaque deposition, but it's accelerated by 10 to 20 years. So the, the biological burden, the history that these brains have suffered in some ways has made them more susceptible to more accelerated age-related loss. Uh, and what we've shown here is not something new as a finding, but shown that the same PET ligands that are used for imaging amyloid in patients with Alzheimer's disease can <coughs> image uh, the amyloid in patients with TBI. Uh, there's a slight side story to this. This control is me. And I was the first person to be imaged in, in Cambridge with PIB, with amyloid. And I saw all this and I thought, what does that mean? Have I got Alzheimer's or is this just normal? Luckily, it was just normal. Though I'm scared to have another one in case things have got much worse. <laughs> there we go. So this is all great. But the question with all of this imaging, is this too much of a good thing? Potentially, center TBI is likely to provide over 7,000 CT images up to 5,000 MR images. We can't manually analyze this. The problem is when we did the contusion study and, and the DTI study with Virginia, she sat down, drew the ROIs. We can't do that with 5,000 patients, 5,000 scans. And also, it wouldn't be objective because we need something that's much more objective. There has been automated analysis in other settings, for example, Alzheimer's disease and stroke. But we have a particular problem with TBI. There's no prediction by pathology. We know that the BRAC classification says that the sequence of events in Alzheimer's disease follows a certain pattern. In stroke, we know it's a middle cerebral artery stroke. This is the bit that's going to be at, at risk. With TBI, it's distributed across the brain. The mechanical insult is unpredictable. And the key di driver of disability is very subtle. We need advanced imaging to look at it. TBI affects the whole brain. It's very unusual to find any bit of the brain that's normal. And that's being recognized now in animal models as well. There's substantial distortion of the anatomy at late stages, so co-registering these brains is a big problem. This makes anatomical segmentation and volumetry very difficult. So some examples, these are the um, intensity profiles from lesion and healthy tissue. And you can see the huge overlap for T1, T2 uh, flare and, and diffusion-weighted imaging. Lesions vary in size and shape. This, if you like, is a map across 110 patients where lesions are most likely to be for contusions, not for traumatic axonal injury. And you can see that the frontal and, uh, and temporal parts of the brain are most common. And hand engineering features for detecting these is going to be very difficult. So the person who's come to our rescue there is a collaboration with uh, the uh, biomedia group at Imperial College, uh, led by uh, Daniel Ruckert, and, and the person who's leading this part is Ben Glocker, who used to be at Microsoft Research and is now a, a lecturer at Imperial College. And what he's been using is deep convolutional neural network processes to try and understand uh, 
to try and provide platforms that allow us to identify and segment lesions. And uh, also, uh, in the early layers of the neural network, uh, to try and find out what are the, the, the various features that are being detected so we can try and relate them to how radiologists and clinicians look at it. And they've been doing a grand job to the extent now that when we want to undertake further validation, what I've said to Costas is you do it, run it through your neural network and come back. And if we've got anything wrong, we'll tell you. There'll be some places where there's a mismatch. What, what it doesn't have is the prior knowledge that looks at susceptible to the artifact from bone or from uh, some other part of the anatomy that it's not aware of. And this is an example of how it does. That's the flare image on top. This is the manual outlining of lesions. This is uh, Costas's convolution neural network. And this is another uh, technique, uh, random forest, which we originally started with. And we found that uh, the, the convolution neural network is, is much more accurate in doing what we're doing. And then we have to look at anatomy, because we want to look at whether there's volume loss or not. And you only have to look at this brain coronally, showing that it's completely screwed up. It, it would be virtually impossible to take this and put this into normal uh, co-registration system to normalize it. And what uh, Christian Leidig, who was in Imperial, has now gone, he's gone on to elsewhere, did was to use an expectation maximization uh, approach to improve this. It's still not perfect. There are still problems. But the important thing for us is to apply it to all 5,000 data sets and say, which are the 100 or even the 500 in which it's failed in which we can tweak it manually. But all of those require a very complicated pipeline. Um, this is just for one sequence, a T1 weighted MP rate sequence. And Stefan Vincek, uh, Wisnek and um, um, Maria Correa uh, from Cambridge have been putting that together. And hopefully we'll have, in fact, we have now a pipeline for mild TBI. And we are just applying it to moderate and severe TBI, which is more of a challenge. Now, a lot of what we want to do has been helped enormously by what's called the Common Data Elements Project, which was run by the NIH, uh, NINDS, and the Department of Defense about five, ten, six years ago, where there was a consensus on how we would describe different clinical variables, and it's made a huge difference. That was led by Andrew Maas uh, and, and several of us who are participating in INTBER. And what we had were clear definitions, but though that's made things better, it hasn't made things perfect. So, for example, there are ambiguities in implementation. So the Glasgow Outcome Score is our commonest way of describing disability. But when we started talking to each other, we found out that there was no clear consensus on whether when you describe this disability, you try to parcel it out what you thought was the TBI-related disability from that caused by something else. So I'll give you an ex extreme example. If someone has a traumatic brain injury and a spinal cord injury and is, is paraplegic, and you look at their total disability, it's going to be substantial. So the sensible thing there is to actually say, well, we're going to get rid of the paraplegia as a consequence of the spinal cord injury and quantify the disability otherwise. But the flip side of that is that if the lesion is not that clear cut, if you've got, I don't know, open fractures of the tibia, a fracture of the pelvis, and the patient's not able to move about very well, do you parcelate what proportion of it to uh, the traumatic brain injury and what to the peripheral injury? So there's no right answer, but we need to know how we deal with this. And then more, m most recently, we've been trying to pull together the genetics uh, of this. There's a pragmatic consortium of the Interbur partners and some historic collections. We've got a minimum phenotype and a common genotyping platform that's going to be across three centers. We've taken this to the Wellcome Trust. They've approved our outline application. And we've got more and more people joining. So we now have 12,000 patients with this uh, basic phenotype. The uh, final application goes in on the uh, finish. Done, nearly done. Uh, the goes in on the 11th of November. If any of you are reviewers for the welcome or know anyone who's reviewers for welcome, uh, please tell them how wonderful the study is. <laughs> <laughs> so we have these repositories uh, and resources in center TBI, the clinical data, the physiological data, neuroimaging, DNA, circulating biomarkers, and the outcome data. And very importantly, on a country-by-country -country basis, patient identifiers looking at that long-term outcome, whether there's an impact on, uh, on late neurodegeneration. And finally, we've set up research networks, which is why I think in this context, it's important to make the point that INCF has played a key role in this area. It's put together people in Europe who've got common interests. And it's put together people across uh, the, the, the globe 
through the interaction with one mind, which I can't speak of highly enough, in order to make people uh, talk to each other more because it's in their common interests. As researchers, we tend to be quite selfish and it's made us realize that talking and sharing stuff is important. So it's more than the sum of its parts. There's the logic of common data platforms, the opportunities provided by treatment variations, the strength in numbers, and the power of networks. And I made the point about the dividends that this capital will yield and the fact that for us in Center TBI, INCF are the bankers. But this costs, this data sharing in the future costs, and some of the ethical and, uh, and um, practical issues of data sharing was something that was discussed in the FENS uh, symposium a couple of months ago. But if you go to ADNI and you talk to the ADNI investigators, they say that the data sharing that they've undertaken to provide is 10 to 15% of personal and project costs. That's a lot of money. And ADNI is very richly endowed. They have got uh, probably about uh, 60 million for studying 6,000 patients with diary, you come and uh, come on Tuesday, oh, I can't make it on Tuesday, oh, well, Wednesday, I've got a party on Tuesday. Whereas we are having these difficult phenotypes to collect. But we simply don't have the money, so when we come to data share, it's really important for us to find ways of resourcing it. So I, I think this is my, my last slide, uh, which talks more generally, but also about data integration, analysis, and sharing. There are substantial opportunities. The harmonization of data acquisition is a continuing challenge. For imaging, a lot of this could be done at source. Just like we insist that when you do a biochemical assay that you say, I want the blood urea in millimoles per liter, there's no reason why regulatory uh, authorities can't impose on imaging uh, vendors the requirement to create more common language. However, even with that, there would be difficulty in imaging pipelines in uh, severely injured brains. We need to develop uh, physiological methods, uh, data method, analysis methods of physiological data, and robust statistical frameworks for analysis. I and mean, when we're reporting studies, if you're drawing 20 conclusions from the same data using a similar analysis, we born for only correct it. But if you think about the ADNI data, there are probably hundreds of very similar conclusions which have interrogated the data in the same way, and no arrangement has been made to correct for multiple comparisons there. Should you or shouldn't you? We don't know. There's some basic statistics that's important. We need to get around regulatory barriers. The emerging EU data legislation is going to be a problem. You won't even be able to send the data to the UK because it's out there outside the EU, what with Brexit. But this is really important. And this is why it's so important for me to come and talk to this audience. There's a huge shortage of appropriately trained individuals. We need data scientists to develop, implement, and use big data. There are likely to be 4.4 million IT jobs in big data by 2020, it's been estimated, and the current training pipelines will only deliver one third of these. So I'm in competition, not just for people to come and work with us in research, but also to train clinicians and provide them with literacy to communicate with people like that. And current academic credits undervalue these people, and it's really important. But the biggest challenge, of course, is you've got lots of big beasts, and the whole process in Center TBI is like herding cats. But there is a book that tells you about that. <laughs> so so I, I'll stop there. I've spoken on behalf of a lot of people, seeming, to my mind, uh, to pretend to be knowledgeable about things that I'm not really about. But if you email me, I'll direct your questions to the right people. Thank you very much.